tiramisu. Oh. So uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, dual optimization problems and how do you solve dual optimization and this is pretty much the only class, class that we will spend uh, on these class of problems. Uh, before we start, uh, let us recall that Q is concave and uh, D is convex, right? So this is a recap, something that we have studied previously. And we want to solve maximization of Q we want to solve max of q mu, mu in d, mu greater than or equal to 0. We want to solve this optimization problem. And the question is, well, how do we solve them? Specifically, when x might be uh, uh, the original space x over which we are solving the primal optimization problem, that might be some sort of integer, uh, have some sort of integer constraints, OK? So, so how should we go about solving it? So I want to introduce in class today subgradient methods, which are different from gradient methods, slightly different from gradient methods. Okay. So what is subgradient? So let's first. Uh, look at the picture of a convex function that's not differentiable okay so let's start with a very simple convex function this is my x this is my fx and this is my convex function fx equals absolute value of x So what's the gradient here on this side? 1, right? For x less than 0, so at this point your gradient of f of x is equal to 1. On this side your gradient of f of x equals negative 1. What happens at 0? Okay, at 0 the gradient is not defined. Okay. But what can be defined? So what happens in a in a function that is differentiable? Well, how do you define the gradient here? Well, you draw a line. This is a convex function, by the way. This is also a convex function, and this is also a convex function. So how do you define a gradient? Well, this is my uh, gradient d. And what's the equation for this line? So let's say this is my f this is my x so I have f of x so the equation for this line is f of x plus uh, d transpose z minus x okay so that's the equation for this line let's say h of z equal to 0 so this line is defined by some variable z okay so every point on this line is a variable z and this line is defined by this particular expression f of x plus d transpose z minus x so how do we know that for this particular convex function that vector d is a gradient how do we know that this is a gradient well what you see is you pick any point z Okay, this number is h of z and if you look at this number, this is f of z. Okay, and it so turns out that if d is equal to gradient of f of x implies for this convex function, it implies that h of z 
will always be less than equal to f of c. Right? All of you, all of you agree with this. This is true for convex function. Okay. Okay. So any line that you draw and the line is tangent to the point then the line will always remain below the convex function itself. Okay? So let's transfer this idea for functions that are differentiable to a function that is not differentiable. Okay? So that's this function. So now I can draw a line which passes through this point at which the function is not differentiable. And what I see is, well, this entire function is actually above this line. Okay? I can draw this line. And that also satisfies. So this is my h1 of z. This is my h2 of z, and so on. Okay, I can draw multiple lines, and the function will always lie above the line. So that's the definition of subgradient. So the direction of this line will be called as uh, the the subgradient. So d is so f is a function from R n to R. Uh, convex need not be differentiable. So D is subgradient of f of x if and only if, this is the definition, if and only if f of z is greater than or equal to f of x plus d transpose z minus x. for all z in Rn. You know, I think I shouldn't write this as direction d. Direction d would be probably in this direction. It will be normal to the surface. Uh, in case it's a, a derivative of the function. Okay, so derivative of a function is always normal to the surface of the function. So this d is subgradient uh, of this convex function f of x. Is a subgradient of, actually I shouldn't write it as f of x because f of x is a value; it's not a function. Subgradient of f at x, if and only if. Okay, and I am going to define. So now we know from this particular example that there is no unique subgradient. Okay, you can have a family of subgradients. So we use del f x to denote the set of all subgradients of f at x. Okay, so in this case, for this particular function, del f of x equals to 1 if x is greater than 0. Anything d in minus 1, 1 if x is equal to 0 and negative 1 if x is less than 0. Okay. So that defines the subgradient of this particular function. Okay, so we have a unique subgradient here. We have a unique subgradient in this region, but then you have a family of subgradients or a set of subgradients at x equal to 0. Okay. So, any question so far? Yes. This is only, only subgradient is only defined for convex. Okay. 
Now, if you have a non-convex function, you can define subgradient locally, okay? But you can't define subgradient globally, yeah, for a convex region around the point, okay? Now, remember, we want to solve this problem. Now, this function may be non-differentiable, but we know that it's a concave problem. So instead of using the idea of gradient, we define the idea of subgradient, which generalizes the idea of gradient. Okay, so gradient is unique. If you have a differentiable function, you have a unique gradient, gradient of f of x. But when you have a non-differentiable function, you might have a family of uh, gradients, or rather subgradients. Okay, uh, for concave function, you would define. How would you define subgradients for a concave function? Well. If f is concave, then minus f is convex. So define the set of all subgradients for the convex function. The other thing I wanted to I wanted to discuss is the necessary condition for optimality when the function is not differentiable. So f o n c first order necessary condition. So x star is optimal if, by the way, actually I shouldn't write f o n c because if we are concentrating our attention to convex function, then it's also a sufficient condition. Uh, so f o n c and, and s c, and s c because f is convex. So x star is optimal if 0 belongs to the subgradient of f at x star if f was differentiable then gradient of f at x star is gradient of f well subgrade well so if f is differentiable then del f x star equals to just the gradient of f at x star and you know that this is going to be equal to 0 right an unconstrained minim minimum of a convex function so this is going to be 0 so 0 lies in the set of subgradients of f at x star now if if you want to solve this problem minimum of f of x such that x is in some convex at x then for this case f is convex x is convex so then you say that x star optimal if and only if there exists a d in the set of subgradients of f at x star such that t transpose z minus x is greater than or equal to 0 for all z minus x star, for all z in capital X. Okay. So that's uh, that's nice. That uh, that generalizes the ideas that we have studied for differentiable functions. Now, how would you run a gradient descent algorithm? Well, let's say you start with this one. This one is similar. You sort of project the gradient. So if you start for this or for unconstrained problem, you define x k plus one equals x k plus alpha k d k where minus d k belongs to the subgradient of f at x k minus d k belongs to the subgradient of f at x k okay so that's the gradient descent for uh, for unconstrained problem now for constrained problem you would do the projection so that will be 
x k plus alpha k d k plus minus d k belongs to the sub gradient of f at x k. You can pick any any d k. Okay, you don't have to restrict yourself to a specific d k. Uh, but of course, if you choose your d k more carefully, according to some uh, some uh, according to some fashion which has nice property. Uh, then you will make sure that your convergence is faster. Okay. The second thing is, how do you know that you have conversed to a optimal solution or not? Well, you have to check whether zero lies in the subgradient of f or not. Okay. Because in this case, you were using one. Let's say you started with some x which is greater than zero. You were using one as the subgradient all the time, and then you converse to something close to zero okay or you converse to zero then you have to check well you can use negative 1 if you are not careful you will probably choose negative 1 okay or you will choose positive 1 uh, in while working on this iterations but then you have to realize that well zero lies in this set of subgradients so you should probably stop okay there's no point of running the iterations further Okay, is that is that clear? Typically, when you are solving an optimization problem where f is differentiable, you will know because the gradient of f at x k will become equal to zero, right? As you go, as you come closer and closer to the optimal point. But in case you are solving a problem where the function is not differentiable, then you have to check whether subgradient, the set of subgradients, contains zero or not. Okay, so that's a little bit of overhead to your optimization problem. Okay, but the main purpose uh, of this, uh, this, these two algorithms that I've written is that the ideas from gradient descent can readily be applied to the case where the function is not differentiable. Okay, so if your advisor asks you. You know, here is a non-differentiable convex function. Go and find the local minimum or global minimum. You can't say that I can't run gradient descent, okay? Because then he'll go, he'll come and tell you that well, you can run subgradient descent, okay? So you will have to solve the problem. Uh, in some cases, yes. Most cases, no. Uh, so I mean, of course, you have to realize that whatever we have studied so far is completely general theory. Now you have individual fields where they look at very specific problems for which they have probably come up with good heuristics by now to solve the problems. Right? Uh, I mean, the, the, the best application that I can think of is electricity market, where they have to solve an integer programming problem every day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they literally have to solve it every day. You know, for three hours, they just run their algorithm to figure out all the constraints are met and so on. Uh, and they have come up with good heuristics. So it, it takes them about three hours to solve a problem for uh, a sufficiently big geographical area. Okay. Okay, so that was a brief introduction to uh, subgradient method. Any question about that? Yeah. Well, the, the only change is that instead of saying that your dk should be negative of gradient of fx k, now you say that your dk can lie, well, minus dk can lie in the subgradient. It can be in, it can be any subgradient of the function at xk. So we have to first find the subgradient set. That's right. That's right. Or at least one subgradient in the set. Sorry? Rule. Yeah, yeah, you can use uh, Armio's rule or whatever, right? So that's not a problem. Okay. So let's go back to this problem and try to solve it, or not solve it, but at least give you some intuition about how you can go about solving this uh, dual problem. And remember, the weak duality says 
that q star q star is less than or equal to f star so if you want to solve this problem it means that you want to find a lower bound to f star so how do you do that So remember that q mu is n of x in capital X L of x comma mu. Let me say that this is equal to x mu comma mu. Okay, so x mu is the arg n here. So x mu is the arg min of x in x L of x comma mu. So for a fixed mu, you have x. Sub mu that gives you uh, the value at the Lagrangian at which the Lagrangian is minimized. Okay, and what is the uh, L of x mu? This is f x mu plus mu transpose g x mu. So the first fact. Well, gradient of mu, gradient of q mu, if it exists, will be equal to g of x mu. Okay. Why? Well, you can take the differentiation with respect to mu, and what you get is just g of x mu. Okay, you can also show it using the uh, expression for the subgradient. Okay, so in particular, what you can show is q mu bar is less than or equal to q mu plus mu bar minus mu transpose g. X mu. Okay, and the theorem is X compact. So that is compact is closed and bounded. So X is closed and bounded. F G J uh, continuous. I think they we require continuity. <coughs> yeah, F and G J continuous, so you don't need differentiability here. Uh, unique X mu unique minimum of L of x comma mu over x then you can show Q is differentiable almost everywhere Okay. Almost everywhere has a mathematical meaning, so don't 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 think that I'm just writing some crap on the board. Uh, so it's almost everywhere means there may be a few isolated points at which it may not be satisfied. So Q may not be differentiable, but almost everywhere else, so except for those isolated points, everywhere else Q is going to be differentiable. And gradient of Q mu is going to be equal to g of x mu okay so that tells us that under fairly well i shouldn't say fairly general condition because you probably need a convexity of 
L of x mu or strong convexity of the Lagrangian in order to prove that x mu will be a unique minimum of L of x comma mu. But, but as we know convexity is not the only condition under which you have a unique minimum. You can have just a strictly increasing function or something of something of that type. So a function of this type is not convex but it has an, a strictly increasing property due to which it has a unique minimum. Okay? So if you have properties of that type then you can probably prove this result or rather prove this hypothesis holds for your problem. And then what you get as a result is that Q, the dual problem is differentiable almost everywhere and so if you want to maximize it just use this as the gradient right by the way in this case it's called gradient ascent not gradient descent okay so if you want to run an algorithm you have to take mu k plus 1 equals mu k plus alpha k gradient of q mu k okay so there is no negative sign here because you want to maximize okay so this is positive okay and this is known as gradient ascent okay so you can run this gradient ascent with the gradient of q replaced with g of x x mu and eventually you will converse to mu star of course you have to make sure that you satisfy these constraints so you might have to project and all that uh, how would you project well if mu equals r r so if this was mu in r r so this is just a box constraint and so projection of this this vector onto mu greater than or equal to 0 is fairly straightforward right yeah Right, right. Uh, why is that beneficial? Well, your original problem is non-convex. Okay, uh, you want to find a lower bound on f star, so you have to solve this problem. Now, instead of solving a constraint optimization problem, you are solving an easier problem. Okay, which is a convex problem with convex constraint. Okay. Most of the times this constraint is actually going to look like this which is fairly simple and straightforward. If you have to do projection you know what to do. Right? Uh, so the key issue, the, the good thing here is even though the original problem may be hard to solve, it's always, well not always, but in most of the cases it's easier to solve the dual problem either because the dimensionality is low okay or and also because it's a concave problem now you might say that well you know in this case x mu is the unique minimum of l of x comma mu how do i compute x mu okay uh, well it turns out that uh, even if you don't have an exact estimate of x mu you probably will run a minimization of L of x comma mu for a few steps, you will converse to something that is close to x mu, okay, even if it is approximately close to x mu, you can use g evaluated at x mu, you don't have to care about whether the constraints are met or not by x mu, okay, so you don't want g of x mu to be less than or equal to 0. All you figure out is g of x mu, plug it in here, update your mu k plus 1, go back to this expression compute the argument, compute x mu k plus 1, substitute it here and then go back to solve the original problem. And at points where this function is not differentiable, this would still be within the set of, so 
g of x mu will be in the sub gradient of g of x mu will be in the sub gradient in the set of sub gradients of q at mu okay but you still have to check whether zero lies in the sub gradient or not okay so that's that's a problem that's still a problem that someone needs to solve uh, for which there are heuristics for specific applications okay but for general case there's no general technique that you can use uh, for these class of problems so slowly of course until now we were talking about general theory uh, from now onwards well you know this is the last topic in static optimization that we are studying okay so there's no other static optimization that we will study but those of you who will go into specific fields like electricity market or uh, uh, operations research then you will learn for your specific problem what kind of heuristics would make more sense okay instead of these general techniques that may or may not work for your specific problem okay any other question no okay so the next topic is we want to identify the set okay what's the set of sub gradients of q at mu for some specific cases okay some restricted cases so the first one is when integer programs with linear constraints okay so traveling salesman problem was one one kind of integer programs with linear constraint so in this case typically your q of mu will be of the form i want to minimize a i transpose mu plus b i where i is in some index set i okay so for this i am going to define i at mu to be equal to i in i such that okay these are the set of active constraints at mu so how would you characterize the set of sub gradients at q well the theorem is del q mu is equal to the set of all d such that d equals to summation ci i in i mu ci greater than equal to 0 summation of ci is equal to 1 i in i mu okay so that gives you an idea about what a sub gradient set for this class of uh, dual functions would look like okay so this is convex combination of ais okay and but convex in a very specific sense well you this is a uh, ci all add up to 1 and they are non negative so this will be your a1 this will be your a4 this will be your a6 okay so 1 4 and 6 they are in this set i mu and so your sub gradient set is every point in the convex combination of a1 a4 and a6 okay so this is all part of this is all part of the sub gradient of q at mu 
So in this case, it's easy to uh, easy to characterize the set of subgradients at a specific point. Okay, any question about that? So when we talk about uh, problems of that type, the problems that are non-differentiable, uh, it's good to know the set of all subgradients because you want to check whether zero lies in this set or not, right? But in general, I can't give you a general formula that will work for all possible problems. Uh, but in some restricted cases, there are specific formulas. So this is one such case where you can characterize the entire set of subgradients at a specific point of this concave function q okay and these this particular for, form of uh, q appears in integer programming problems specifically with linear constraints okay so what about second derivative is it easy to calculate second derivative well yes and no uh, in order to compute second derivative, you need to know, let's see what the second derivative would look like, okay? So we said that, well, first derivative exists under some conditions. Let's see if we can compute the second derivative. Actually, I don't want to compute. I just want to give you the, the formula. So second derivatives are useful when you want to run Newton's method for these class of problems. So if your f dj are convex, your x is equal to rn, the second derivative of the Lagrangian is strictly positive definite at x star comma mu star at x star mu star then in the neighborhood of x star mu star you can write the second derivative of q with respect to mu is given by minus g x mu transpose second derivative of l inverse gradient of g at x mu. No, no, no. This is this is only for uh, the integer program part ends here. Okay. This is if you want to run Newton's iterations for this problem, then you need to know the second derivative. So how would you find second derivative? Well, this is the expression for second derivative. So this covers all. Yeah. So this is the first derivative. Okay. If it exists, this is the second derivative. If it exists. Okay, so this was sort of a short introduction to solving uh, dual problems. Uh, there is an entire chapter in the book dedicated on solving dual problems, but uh, that's not part of the syllabus. Uh, so we won't talk about it, but of course, uh, I, I know that there is a course in network optimization that's uh, I think 7,000 or 8,000 level course where they go more into solving dual optimization problems, but specific to wireless networks, okay, because that's a wireless networks course. So maybe other departments will have their own set of uh, uh, courses for specific application that looks into primal and dual problems and how do you solve them, perhaps together. 
so as to converse to the solution and check whether you are close to the optimal solution or not. So in, in particular for the electricity market case that I, uh, that I have uh, constantly talked about over the period of the course and you have solved two specific problems right, in your assignments, the typical idea, the typical thing to do in electricity market is, well, you have a huge integer program with thousands of variables. Uh, you solve that integer program using some heuristic. You solve the dual program. Okay? And what you prove is, well, you receive, you got a value of x with x heuristic. Okay? So you ran your algorithm for three hours. You got some x heuristic. Uh, which is feasible, satisfies all reliability constraint. You plug in the function f. Uh, so you plug in the solution x heuristic to the function f, which was your objective function, and you show that this minus q star, right, q star by solving this problem, this is whatever, small. Okay? And since this is small, you know that you're almost you are almost there, okay? you are very close to the optimal point, and then they stop. Okay? Then they stop and they say that you know, this is what the solution is, this is how things are going to happen for the next day. There are some, uh, some interesting problems for, I guess, uh, I don't know whether they are problems for research or not, but there are interesting problems. So you see when you say, so. So think about what's the market for electricity, okay? It's a multi-billion dollar industry, okay? And so even if the small is, I don't know, 1% of Q star, <laughs> you are looking at a loss of tens of millions of dollars, okay? So I don't know whether it's, a, it's something to research about, or it's fine if they are losing, if we are all as consumers of electricity, if we are all losing collectively, if we are losing one, tens of millions of dollars every, every day, if that is fine. Well, not every day, but over a period of a year. Uh, if you're losing that kind of money, it's completely fine. I mean, there's nothing much we can do about it because the original problem itself is so hard to solve. I don't know whether it's a good research problem or not, but something to think about, okay? This is uh, known as efficiency loss, but the efficiency loss is not because of the market, because of the wave ma market function. It's because of the limitations of the algorithms that we have designed to solve uh, a fundamentally very difficult problem. And, and this, this problem is becoming worse and worse as you move to renewable energy, okay, because they are very, they vary over a period of day, it's very hard to predict and so on. So maybe some of you would become a faculty someday and work on this issue, I don't know. You know, I thought I'll work as a faculty on these issues, but then I didn't get a chance to work. Uh, this class is taking a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> 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 More than I had anticipated. Okay, uh, let's uh, talk about dynamic optimization problems. That's the next topic. Okay, and we are will remain in the deterministic setting, okay? So we don't want to consider stochastic optimization. So the idea is as follows. There is some state xt plus one, which is a function of xt and ut. So what is xt? xt is the state of a system at time t and ut is the control action or decision variable at time t. 
So, so whenever you consider a physical system, okay, you are always, in most cases, you will be able to identify a state of the system. And what is a state? How do you define a state of a system? Well, the state at time t plus 1 should depend on the state at time t and the decision that you have taken at time t. Okay, so if you think about your bank balance, your bank balance is the state, okay, your financial state. And at time t plus 1, it depends on what your bank balance was earlier plus how much you earned minus how much you spent. Okay? So it will grow or it will go down depending upon ut. Okay? So that's the state of a system. If you think about this room, uh, the air conditioning system is trying to either pump heat into the system or take out, extract heat from the system. Okay? So in that case, the temperature of the room becomes the state of the system and ut will be how much heat is added to the to the air in the uh, to the air in the room or how much heat has been extracted from the air uh, within the room okay so that's ut in the case of an autonomous car or a general car your xt would be the gps position of the vehicle and ut would be the direction in which you are driving the velocity as well as the vector along which you are driving the vehicle okay so in a large class of systems you can identify a state and a decision variable that needs to be optimized over a period of time. Okay, so we want to, so the goal is find optimal decision variables over time. Over time that maximizes slash minimizes some performance index. Okay, and typically the performance index would be represented by J, which is a function of U1 to UT, capital T, so that's the horizon length, so T is sorry, t, is the horizon length, so this is known as and this is equal to some gt plus 1, xt plus 1, plus summation t equals 1 to capital T, gt, xt, comma, ut. Okay, so we want to minimize this total cost, and we want to minimize. So, minimize over U1 to U capital T. Okay, so this is known as the running cost, okay, because it changes with time, and this one is known as terminal cost, okay, so GT plus 1, it's important to know these terms because everyone else uses it, uh, so GT plus 1 is terminal cost and GT is running cost. Okay. How many of you have seen problems of this type before? I know people who are working in, auto in Center for Automotive Research, they work on dynamic optimization, but can you Put your hands up, how many of you have seen this class of problems before? Okay, many of you. 
So you probably are already motivated to study this class of problem. Reinforcement learning is one step ahead of this problem. It's more advanced, yeah. Yes, it is, yeah. So for reinforcement learning, you have to have a noise here, and what else? So in reinforcement learning, you have a, the state transitions according to a ram random fashion, and you essentially are doing dynamic programming, which is something we'll cover as part of solving this problem. Okay? Actually, we will talk about Markov decision problems probably after Thanksgiving. Okay. Typically, your xt would lie in the, so this is known as state space, and then ut would lie in some capital U, which is action space. Okay, so if you think about your steering wheel, if that's your action variable, then the steering wheel can only be rotated maybe uh, 90 degrees towards the right and 90 degrees towards the left. Okay, so that becomes your action space, minus 90 to plus 90, or minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. That becomes your action space. Okay, so I think it's, uh, anyone has question with the formulation? Okay, so there are two ways to view this problem. One is to view this problem from the point of view of a static optimization problem. Okay, so what you do is you minimize, you run a gradient descent for this big optimization problem with this huge cost. You run an optimization and you find u1 star, u2 star all the way up to ut star. Okay, that's one point of view. The other point of view is because this problem is dynamic, let's concentrate on a small piece of the problem, solve it, then extend the solution to a larger piece of the problem, solve it, and then extend the solution to a larger piece of the problem and solve it. Okay, so the first approach where you solve everything at once comes from what is known as maximum principle. The second approach where you decompose the problem into a sequence of static optimization problems is known as dynamic programming. Okay? So we'll study both these, uh, both these ideas in the subsequent classes. We'll spend quite a bit of time on this class of problems. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll talk about an application of this idea to neural network. Okay, so that we'll do maybe uh, next week. Okay, so thank you guys. I'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>